But it does bring up this question then, if they all have these things in common, how do we distinguish the major MPNs from each other, specifically essential thrombocythemia, polycythemia vera, and myelofibrosis? Jamil, would you like to talk about well, I that? I think that we've all had uh, patients who have a classical presentation for, let's say, ET, with isolated thrombocytosis and eject to positivity. Or you've had a patient who has uh, erythrocytosis with very high hematocrit and eject to positivity. So I think uh, some cases are certainly uh, very easy to make a diagnosis. But obviously, when it comes to the MPNs, there's a great deal of overlap among all entities. And I think, in uh, to some respect, that's why the WHO 2016 classification emphasized the role of a bone marrow biopsy because, and probably placed a little bit more um, pressure on pathologists so that they can actually make the distinction among the three entities because in a way it makes sense, as you have said, JAK2 mutation uh, puts all three entities together, but I think we need to sort of separate them out because obviously you may end up with a patient who has PV but iron deficient, okay? So they're not going to manifest with a very high hematocrit or hemoglobin and hence the diagnosis may be in question. And that's, I think, where the bone marrow biopsy may come in handy uh, because obviously if you see pamyelosis, you can see megakaryocytic um, clustering plus granulocytic proliferation, then you'd be more inclined to call this PV as opposed to just seeing clusters of uh, megakaryocytes plus thrombosis, uh, in which case you may favor ET. Uh, on the other hand, there's this new entity of prefibrotic uh, myelofibrosis, which also needs to be distinguished from ET because those patients will not have fibrosis on their bone marrow biopsy, which is typically the case uh, in cases of primary myelofibrosis, I suppose uh, post PV and ET myelofibrosis as well. So I think that's an important entity to distinguish from ET because uh, it has a worse prognosis. Yeah, and if I may add, like I think nowadays what we are learning also is that this is a spectrum of myeloid diseases referring to what we call as chronic diseases. You have the MDS, the myeloproliferative, and the MDS-MPN. The hallmark of the myeloproliferative diseases is probably that activation of the JAK stat pathway. We know that there are phenotypic driving mutations that you know, drive the clinical features we see, such as the JAK2, the caroticulin mutation, and the MEPL mutation. And probably what distinguishes those diseases or what makes something looks like AT or PVR sometimes is the sequence and the combination of those somatic mutations that we see that would lead to a certain clinical phenotype that we are seeing. So back to your point, I think now we are understanding much more about the biology that leads to those different presentations or manifestations, but the common thing is really the overactivation of the jak stat pathway. Serge? We now know much more about biology, and we all agree that uh, activation of jak stat pathway is underlying biological problem in all the three classic uh, Philadelphia chromosome negative MPNs. But when we talk about uh, the diagnosis, emphasis is a lot, and it should be, on the bone marrow biopsy as was discussed. But the diagnostic criteria still exist. That means we don't have one test. The bone marrow is not the test. There is no molecular test. It's a combination of tests that need to be combined together for diagnosis to be made. And in myelofibrosis, for example, it is the bone marrow, it is genetics, it is physical exam looking for the spleen, it is CBC looking at the left shift and anemia, and chemistry looking at LDH. So it is really a team effort or experienced clinician who will pull all this information together from different laboratories or test sites to make a diagnosis. You know, it, it sounds simple, but, uh, you know, I'm going to say something that um, I'm a little afraid to say with this panel, but sometimes I'm challenged. Sometimes the pathologists, I give them, they have a bone marrow and they say, this is ET, and yet this young patient keeps having a hemoglobin that goes high, a low EPO level, it's JAK2 positive. To, you know, I feel obliged to treat them like PV, even though they're being called ET. A am I alone here, or and and do, do these things change? Do, do, does a patient shift from one diagnosis to another? I, I, I think the point you raise is an excellent one. I mean, I think we're clearly evolving from the era of, of phenotypes to being, you know, much more precise in our diagnoses. Uh, indeed, you started the conversation uh, regarding Damaschek's observation. It's interesting. Over time, he also had included in that list of myeloproliferative neoplasms things like PNH. That now we know the molecular biology is, is dramatically distinct. You know, so some that are similar, some that are distinct. 
I do think between these three entities, ET, PV, and MF, there clearly is, is a spectrum of overlap. You know, and I think although we try to have very clear subgrouping because of trials uh, through uh, criteria, all of these criteria are, are very helpful the majority of the time, but, but they're not perfect. You know, they are consensus criteria, but they don't truly get at the issue of biology itself. I think the one you raise is really probably the one that overlaps the most. You know, JAK2 mutated ET, is that truly a very distinct entity than polycythemia vera? Again, probably enough to cause a fist fight at any MPN meeting, uh, but you're right. From my end, the, the JAK2 mutated ET patient that has erythrocytosis, functionally I'm treating like polycythemia vera. Uh, it, and I'm not sure there's really any proof to say that that's incorrect. But, and over time, it will be more and more obvious that the patient sure. is evolving into PV. Sure. And then you get in a situation where the patient comes and says, my doctor tells me I have two diseases. I had ET and PV. And my answer is no, you have one, which is changing. Like any other living tissue, acquisition of new mutations, something else happened in the body of the patient leading to disease, to different characteristics. Like, I think what this introduction has done is shown a, a couple of things. One, it shows that um, that clinicians have to be aware of what are the goals of management in each of these diseases because sometimes patients may have manifestations of, of a couple, like ET and PV. And the second is, as we learn more about the biology, hopefully we're going to get more towards targeted agents that, um, that will be directed at the biology. And at the end of this discussion, we'll get to some of those um, agents. 